We live in challenging times. Coronavirus showed us how fragile and vulnerable the global system is when faced with an extreme event like a worldwide pandemic. Complexity theorist and best-selling author John Casti warned about the lacking resilience in the global system in his book X Events many years ago. This interview is part of the so-called COVID pop-up hub initiated by the Austrian Federal Ministry of Climate Action, Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation and Technology to learn our lessons from this crisis and to create a more desirable future. In his book, X Events, Professor Cassidy says, our technology dependent society has become a house of cards, over complex and increasingly vulnerable to sudden collapse. If certain extreme scenarios called X events hit, the flow of communication, transportation, electricity, finance, food, water, and medicine will cease. We will re enter the pre modern world overnight. Professor Casti, would you please elaborate on the described House of Cards and how it is crumbling in the current situation? We live in a very complex society. And this society is composed of a large number of interacting subsystems. At the highest level, we have level, uh, systems like communication, uh, food supply, energy, and so on. But each one of those systems is itself composed of a large number of subsystems. Think about food supply. You have the farmer who actually grows the food, the uh, intermediary who actually harvest the food, then there's the subsystem that transports it to where it gets processed, then there's the processors and a few other steps that I didn't mention before, it finally ends up in the box on the shelf at the supermarket. Now in order for the system, the overall system, to really work, every one of those systems has to work. We can't afford to have any of them go offline. And of course, we've been, been accustomed to how to deal with that possibility uh, because mostly the type of events that occur that push a system or a subsystem offline are pretty localized. And we can have alternative suppliers for the service that has been lost. And that's fine. In, in general, the end consumer doesn't even notice when the system goes offline uh, or a subsystem goes offline. But all of those, let's say, safety zones, if you want to call them that, they don't work anymore when you get into a major X event that affects, in this case, the whole society, like the coronavirus. This is a system which is not destroying so much the individual subsystems, but it's getting rid of the people who operate those systems. All of a sudden, people who used to be responsible for one, uh, transporting food or cre uh, creating, uh, running uh, trams or doing other kinds of things that make the system work, they're not there anymore. Uh, they're either, they're, they might be dead, they might be sick in their bed or whatever, but they're gone. And that means that the system cannot be substituted with a new system uh, because the new system has the same problem as the original system. Not enough people who are needed to actually keep the system going. And so, of course, what you end up with is what you see, a kind of a, uh, it's like weekend service not uh, everyday service where, you know, the uh, subways don't run as frequently as they did. The uh, things that you have on the shelves in the supermarket get grabbed up and don't get replaced in the way that they used to and so on. And so we have to ask ourselves, well, are we facing a world in which this is going to be the norm, not something extraordinary, but we're going to be faced with either an epidemic or a major climate failure or some uh, cyber attack or some other kind of major 
unplanned for an unexpected event that's going to you know, come in and impact the systems that were become have become used to for everyday life. And if that's the case, and there are a lot of people, I might even be among them, who would argue that uh, it's more likely than not to be the case that we'll just be faced with one major X event after another, after another. And eventually people will get tired of it. Uh, so before that happens, we have to figure out how can we protect ourselves against these kinds of things? And roughly speaking, uh, I mean, I'm not talking about some specific system now, but just in general, roughly speaking, there are only two ways to do it. One is you have to take the original system, let's say communications, and you have to harden it so that it can withstand a much bigger shock than what you uh, what they look, look like today. And today, they're, they're not hardened in general. And that means that it doesn't take much of a shock to push them offline. Uh, so that, that's one line of attack, is to harden the individual systems so they're much more well protected against much bigger kinds of shocks. Eventually, they'll give out anyway. The shock is big enough, but a lot bigger shock than what we're accustomed to up to now. Or the other uh, alternative, the alternative is that you uh, build in redundancy. You build in, instead of one communication system, you have uh, three or four communication systems. Let's say the main one and backups, if you want. The backup is a redundancy, essentially. You back up your computer is a redundancy. And it protects you when the main system goes down. Uh, and this is what uh, you, I think that we, we have to, we, we have some of it already. Uh, you know, when some electric power subsystem uh, fails, in general, the whole system doesn't go off. Maybe no part of it actually goes off because that missing link is immediately taken up by a backup. And I think that in the end, what we're going to have to uh, try and deal with is some combination of these two things. Something that much more better pro uh, protects the main, lot, the main system. This is like what you do when you uh, try and protect your computer against uh, viruses and so on. Um, you build uh, some additional protection so the computer can function even if it does get attacked by a virus because there's a mechanism to protect you. It's not perfect, but it does a good job. And at the same time, redundancy, having more than one computer, like I have here in my house. I have four computers, and they're all basically the same, and they all talk to each other. And you say, well, why do you do this? Uh, well, one of the reasons I do it is because my main occupation nowadays is writing books, and I don't want to lose that data. <laughs> I want to make sure that and each computer itself has two or three external hard drives connected to it. So in general, there are probably 12 different places at any given moment where this data exists in this house. And even that is no guarantee. I could even, even imagine how that would go uh, totally offline too, in, including me. But uh, the fact is it's, a, it's, it's enough protection to make me feel comfortable. And that, that's what you really have to have, is enough protection that the overwhelming majority of people in the population feel comfortable that they're not, their whole lives are not going to get blown away by the next virus that shows up down the street. So how can we avoid that businesses play zero-sum games and create more sustainable business models instead? What could such business models look like? Okay, well, you know, about 50 years ago, the economist Milton Friedman wrote a short article actually in the New York Times, which set the tone for what later became known as neo-libertarian economics. And translated in everyday language, what that means is, and Friedman even said this in his article, he said, the only business of a corporation is to make money. 
So with that view in mind, of course, this, this was a uh, manifesto, if you like. It was very popular with business people. And as a consequence, since the business people basically managed the politicians, it became very popular with the politicians also. And over the last 50 years since Friedman's uh, manifesto, uh, we have fallen more and more and more into the zero-sum game, the winner-takes-all kind of structure in our economy. And of course, it's only been uh, enhanced by the advance of technology in that 50-year period, which makes it, in some sense, easier to have this kind of a, a corporate structure because communication is, is vastly easier than it used to be. The shipment of parts from one part of the world to another is vastly easier and so on. And so corporations fell into the, what the, we would call now, or did call anyway, uh, a new age of globalization, where uh, if you buy a car in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, almost every piece of that car was made in some other country. And the pieces were only brought together and maybe assembled in a factory in the USA. But the supply line, the supply chain was enormous, a very long. And why was it so long? It was because each individual part needed to be make, made at the a certain level of quality at the cheapest price possible. So the corporate managers shopped around to find out where the labor costs were low and the skill level was at least high enough to make the parts that they needed. And they outsourced the manufacturing, essentially the manufacturing of the whole car, with the exception of the final assembly, to every corner of the world that you can imagine. And the, the, the ultimate goal was to fulfill Friedman's um, statement to make money and to make as much money as possible. Uh, and as a consequence of this, uh, the companies that were most successful at doing the outsourcing had the most productive supply chain and so on. They made the most money and they could outcompete the companies that did not have this supply chain success. And pretty soon you found the handful of huge companies rising up beyond the surface, way beyond the surface, and everybody else was just uh, uh, fading away until you only had a handful of companies left in every sector, huge companies. And of course, and the people who run these companies, they were very happy with this because their bonuses only got bigger and bigger and bigger. And their competition got smaller and smaller and smaller. And this was like they'd died and gone to heaven. Uh, the problem is that almost all of the money that was made by the corporations went into the pockets of the people who were managing the companies and almost none of it, none of the benefit, went into the pockets of the people who were actually producing either the parts or assembling the parts into the final product. And so you ended up then with a continual squeezing of the so-called middle class to the point where today it, it, it's almost a joke to talk about the middle class because there are only two classes. There's a huge class of just sort of, I'll say not quite impoverished, but almost impoverished workers and a handful of managers who sweep up a billion, literally billions of dollars. And this is, how, how do you, now how do you get away from this, this system? How do you reverse it? Well, luckily in a way, this virus is helping in that regard because it's starting to, to shut down uh, the Age of Globalization, which was another chapter in my book, Ex Exodus. It was actually titled The End of Globalization. And this is one way it can end. If you don't have the ability to easily travel 
and ship things from one corner of the earth to the, to the next in, in a few minutes. Uh, all you can transfer is information. You can't transfer material bodies, material objects. Then all of a sudden, you have to sort of uh, rethink your whole idea of the supply chain. And basically, the supply chain has to become way more localized than what it's been for the last few decades. And you also then give the opportunity for other companies to enter back into the picture, but maybe in some kind of collaboration with one of the big guys, not necessarily in direct competition. And this is where you end up getting into a little bit of a delicate balancing act between the strictly zero sum winner takes all system and a non-zero sum kind of game where everybody can do okay, but it means some have to be ready to sell for less than what they would get in a pure zero sum environment. Uh, and this is a case of um, the, the, the conflict or the potential conflict. It can easily be solved by the governments if they want to but they probably won't want to because the big guys in the corporate world will put pressure on them not to, are these uh, antitrust laws. This is, the, this is the problem. The antitrust laws, uh, for, in, in theory, forbid any one organization to completely gobble up, let's say, the entire auto manufacturing business or the entire drug man, uh, creation world and so on. And they've worked in that respect. There's no industry that I can think of where there is only one producer, uh, but there are only a handful of them. And essentially they can control the market because there's, there's no new players that uh, can come into the game with enough resources to really be serious competitors. Oh, and, and this is why, in, in certain sense, why it's so remarkable what Elon Musk managed to do to create a completely new car manufacturing operation uh, and become the biggest car co uh, company in the world now. But he did it by being a little bit more clever. He didn't go into direct competition. He went into building a different kind of car. It's the new guy in the block that's threatening to take all. And how can we change management bonus systems in a way that long-term thinking instead of short-term thinking is rewarded? Do we have to create a completely new understanding of how value is created in businesses and beyond? Yeah, well, in one sense, the answer to that question is very easy. Just eliminate all bonuses. No more bonuses. And put a ceiling on salaries for management and then have it be uh, imposed for all corporations so that these manager guys can't say, oh, I'm gonna take a job with the guy down the street because I can get a bonus with him or a higher salary or whatever. But I think that that's, uh, uh, in, in many ways, I personally would think it would be absolutely ideal, but I don't think that the <clears throat> corporate management around the world would think it's ideal. And I don't think that as a consequence, politicians would think it's ideal either. So then you have to step away from that and basically uh, say, well, then maybe you have to change the structure of the bonus system. And that could happen in many different ways. I mean, one way I thought of is, why is it that only the management get these bonuses? Why don't the employees get bonuses? Why doesn't everybody get treated the same way? Uh, and, and not just the upper management. The upper management is not working any harder. They're not doing anything. No matter what they do, if the employees don't do their job, the upper management might as well stay home because there's nothing for them to do. Uh, so why not uh, share share out the, uh, the, uh, the take? Um, Another direction you could go, and, and these are these are all uh, independent in a certain sense, is to have the management bonuses not be keyed into stock price of the corporation. 
and not depend upon uh, the quarterly uh, report that the corporation gives to Wall Street, but have the bonuses be uh, much longer term, and not, not just dependent on what happens over the next three months, but maybe what happens over the next three years, what happens over the next decade, and and have it weighted so that if what happens uh, in terms of the corporation's uh, contribution to society, the competency, you have to get away from this Milton Friedman idea, this libertarianism, that the only thing the corporation can contribute to society is money. But the corporation can contribute jobs, can contribute social welfare, uh, health care services, and so on, besides, th things besides money. And, and that the measurement is on a longer term scale. If you want to get your bonus on a three month scale, then the amount that you can get is limited to be much, 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 much less than what you get if you say, no, no, I'll take my bonus on a five year scale. And, and basically I'll work for five years for a reasonable salary, but no bonus until the end of five years. Uh, and the guy says, well, what happens if I get sacked before five years? Well, you have to put, build in some provision so you get protected from that kind of thing. But I don't think that these are major obstacles that can't be solved. But, but you have to just get away from the bonus being dictated by the stock price of the corporation. Uh, and, and that's something that uh, I don't think that it's impossible to do. The reason it's done now is that I think it's a lot easier to measure than what the health, well health or well-being or happiness of your employees actually is. Uh, but I think that also by extending the bonus system and bringing the employees into the bonus system as well as the management uh, would help enormously. Thank you very much for the interview, Professor Kasten. Very nice. Thank you for having me.